share with you two lessons, two stories for this coming Tisha B'Av. There was once a woman who had a very difficult time getting pregnant and she didn't realize what, know what the story was. She went to her doctor, doctor sent her from some tests and they realized there was some sort of issue and they went from specialist to specialist. Unfortunately, nothing was going. They went to rabbis, they went to Kabbalists, they tried to get all the blessings. So far, nothing was going. Until they decided they had no one else to rely on other than Avinu Shabbat Shalom, our Father in Heaven. They started going and they started breaking the heavens with tears. They started crying and crying and praying to Hashem, saying, please bless us with a healthy child. And then the prayers were answered. All of a sudden she's pregnant and she is so excited. She's so happy. She's running around. She's like, I'm going to love this child more than anything else. I'm going to cherish this child. And the truth is that's what happened. Over the course of nine months, she cherished the child. And when the child came out, Bo Hashem was a healthy daughter. And she loved the child. She cared for the child. And when someone doesn't have a child for a long time, and all of a sudden they have a child, oh, they treat that child so differently. She gave so much attention to the child. The father also gave so much attention to the child. There was such a connection for the child. And they realized the power of their prayers. And they kept on praying for more children. And over the course of the next 15 years, they were blessed for, with more and more children. And... The mother was so involved with the children because she felt she had to work so hard for this that she created something called Mommy and Me Time. That once a week she would spend at least an hour with each and every child just alone. We'll go on walks, we'll go do on different things just to connect. And the children loved it. They were obsessed with it. We're like, when is Mommy and Me Time? When are we going to go? What are we going to do? How am I, what are we going to talk about? They planned it. They were very excited for this. When the youngest boy was about a year and a half old, the mother started feeling some stomach pains and she started thinking, okay, you know, maybe I'm pregnant again. And she goes to the doctor and the doctor says, no, you're not pregnant, but we have to run some other tests. And they start running some tests and the doctor says, you know, it doesn't look good. I need to send you to a specialist. And she's like, you know, what's going on, doc? You know, tell me, like, is everything okay? And he's like, I don't know. I'm going to send you to the specialist and, and you're going to have to do some more follow-ups. So she goes to the specialist and the specialist runs some tests and he goes over and he says, you know, like, I'm sorry to tell you this, but, uh, you know, you have a disease and that disease is a very, very dangerous one and most people don't survive. And she's like, what do you mean? She's like, we're, we're, you know, let's do treatments. And the husband was like, we have to do something. We can't just say, you know, you're not surviving. Well, let, let's do whatever we can. The experimental treatments. Let's do anything. You know, save my wife. She's a mother for crying out loud. And the doctor says, of course, we'll, we'll try whatever it is that we can. And they went and went from treatment to treatment. They tried to do it. But after a period of time, they realized that nothing is helping. And the doctor sort of gave up. And the father's like, I'm, you know, the husband's like, I'm not giving up on my wife. She's like, there's no way. And they go and they run from one specialist to another specialist. And unfortunately, all the specialists come back with the same thing. You know, I'm sorry, it's fatal. It, it, you know, that's it. She has, you know, a few more weeks left at tops. So the mother, you know, and the father, they're trying to cope with this. And the mother says, you know what, you know, you know, the time that I have left, let me, let me spend it with my precious children, the ones that I've cried for so long, the one that I've worked so hard for. And she spent hours and hours with each child. And she goes on, she says, you know, mommy's going to be going away soon and, and mommy's not coming back. And the children were like, what do you mean mommy's not coming back? Like, we need you. You have to be over here. And they cried and they begged the mother, please don't go away. Please stay over here. And she goes and she says, you know, listen, when God says it's time for me to go, it's time for me to go. But you should know that if I'm not here with you, physically, I'm always going to be with you spiritually. I'm always going to be davening. I'm always going to be working for you up in Shemayim. And she went and she had, with each child, she went and she told them what she, she praised them and she cared about them. The children cried and says, please, Pommy, please don't go. We need you. And unfortunately, two days later, the mother returned her soul to her creator. And the funeral was a brutal funeral, as all funerals are, but especially when there's young children. And the children were sitting there when they were crying, when they brought the mother's coffin in. Then there was a little, the little, little boy, little Danny, he's a year and a half years old. He's sitting over there. I mean, he sees everybody crying, so he's a little bit sad, but he's running around. He's playing with us. He doesn't understand. He can't comprehend. He's, you know, and he, you know, he asks during Shiva, he's like, where's mommy? And, you know, like, she's like, no, she, she went to Shemaim. She went to heaven. And he's like, okay, so, but when's she coming back? And he couldn't comprehend. He's a year and a half old. He couldn't comprehend it. And, you know, the saddest thing is, is that, you know, you see the other children, they're mourning. At least they're mourning. They're realizing that mother's not coming back. But the saddest thing is to see that little one, one and a half year old 
smiling and playing as if realizing that his mother is still coming back. He doesn't even realize the, the, the truthful. He doesn't realize the, the severity of the situation. We're coming to Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. We have to make sure we're not that two-year-old. We're not that one-and-a-half-year-old. We're not that toddler, Danny, that's running around and not sure why we're sad. Play life as usual. No, this is the saddest day in the Jewish year. This is a time when we have to mourn for the destruction of the temple. We have to get ourselves into that mindset. When was the last time that you cried for the Bet HaMikdash? When was the last time that you cried that God does not have a home to, 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 to be in? We have to make sure that's coming this Tisha B'Av. Hopefully that it should be the Bet HaMikdash and we shouldn't have to have you know, the Tisha B'Av like we've always had it. But if the Tisha B'Av comes, we have to make sure that we're mourning properly. We're not that two-year-old boy. We're not that toddler running around and playing like every other day. It's Tisha B'Av. It's the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. It's appropriate to mourn. And we have to realize that. And we have to bring upon ourselves to realize what we are mourning for. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two was there was once a father. And this father had two boys. And as the children were getting older, the father goes over to the older son and says, listen, he says, I can't support you anymore. It's time for you to go and work on your own. And the, the boy goes to the father and says, you know, father, I appreciate everything that you have done for me. Thank you. And he gives him a hug, him a kiss, and they part their ways, and, they goes, and this boy goes and travels to the city to go and to try to find a job. He starts, he partners up with another guy, and Bo Hashem, he's extremely successful. He's extremely successful in business, making a ton of money. A few years go by, and the second brother gets older, and the father goes the same thing to the, to the other boy. He says, listen, just like your brother, go out into the field, go out into the world, and work. I, I can't support you any longer. He also gives his father a kiss, gives his father a hug, and he goes his way. But this, this son, the second son, the younger son, wasn't as successful as the, as the older one. He tried one business, and it failed. He tried the other business, and it failed. He tried going from one thing to another, and things weren't working until he lost everything. And then he was homeless, he was hungry, he got no money, he had nothing. And he's thinking, what am I supposed to do? I can't go back to my father. He has nothing. He says, you know what? He remembered. I said, let me go to my father. Let me go to my brother. He traveled to the nearby town where his brother was. He heard his brother is very successful. And he goes and he knocks on the door for his brother. He says, a huge mansion his brother built. And a maid opens up and he says, can I help you? And she says, yeah, is uh, the owner here? Uh, I'm his brother. And the, the maid says, I'm sorry, but uh, he's not here right now. Um, you could try maybe the office. So he says, fine, where's the office? And she gives him direction to the office. He travels to this beautiful building. He goes, he goes in and he sees a, you know, a beautiful you know, lobby, he sees a you know, woman there in the front desk and says, listen, um, is this where so-and-so works? He says his brother's name. And the secretary says, yes, uh, do you have an appointment? And she says, he says, no, I don't need an appointment. I'm his brother. And the secretary goes, you're his brother? And he's like, yeah, is this so-and-so? And she's like, yeah, that's who owns the building. That's who works here. And he's like, yeah, I'm his brother. And she's like, that's funny because he never mentioned that he had a brother. And he says, no, no, tell him that, uh, that his brother's here to see him. So the secretary runs into the back office, comes out a few minutes later, and she says, listen, I'm sorry. To I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, you got the wrong place. The owner says he doesn't have any brothers. And he says, the brother goes and says, what do you mean he doesn't have any brothers? I'm his br he says, Are you, is this this so-and-so name? And she's like, yeah, that, that's, that's the owner. And he says, you know what, can you do me a favor? Can you go and ask him? If his father's name is so-and-so, and he mentions his father's name, and the secretary says, yeah, sure. She goes, she runs to the back, and uh, she comes back a few minutes later, and she says, listen, he says, uh, yeah, that's, his, uh, that's the father, but he says, still, he has no brothers. And this, the brother, the poor brother, the younger brother, starts to see He's like, what? He has no brother? I'm his brother. What are you talking about? And he starts barges right into the office. And the secretary starts trying to stop him. Stop, stop, stop. You can't go there. And he runs in, and he opens the door, and he sees his brother sitting behind the desk over there. And he goes and says, how dare you say that you have no brother? He says, I'm your brother. The guy, the, the older brother, looks and says, who are, I don't know who you. He calls up security. And says, security, there's a crazy guy over here. You got to go and you got to call and get, get him out of here. And he, he start, you know, security comes and they start, you know, pulling him out. And he starts kicking his room and says, how do you say you have no brother? I'm your brother. We live together. What are you doing? What's happened to you? Refuses to budge and they kick him out. A few years go by and both sons get a letter from the father. And the letter reads that, you know, the time is coming for the father to leave this world. And he wants to see his sons one last time. So both sons travel to visit the father. And as both sons enter, the father only addresses the younger son. And he says, you know, you have gave me so much nachas. You have, you're such a, you're the best child that anybody could ask for. And he starts giving him praise after praise after praise, but he's only dealing, he's only focusing with the younger child. He doesn't even say a word to the older child, to the older brother, to the wealthy brother. 
And after like, you know, 30 minutes of him just completely, you know, not even, you know, uh, you know, seeing that the brother is even here in the room, the older brother, the wealthy brother goes and says, Father, am I not your son also? He says, how come you're not speaking to me? How come you're only speaking to the younger son? And he goes, the father looks at him for the first time. And he goes and he points at the younger brother. And he says, if this is not your brother, then I am not your father. We go and we cry and we scream to Hashem, Avinu Shabashamayim, our Father in heaven. We're going, we're crying to God. God, you're our Father. Help us. You know, we go, we cry out to our Father. He says, please help us. But you know what God says? He says, you have brothers in this world. And if you don't consider them your brothers, the entire Jewish nation, we're all one family. We're all brothers and sisters. If you don't consider them your brothers, then I'm not your father. We're asking God for help, but what happened to our brothers and sisters who are sitting there? I need our help. Do we not go and give them the need that, they, we, that we, we should as if we would be brothers and sisters? A scary, unfortunate reality. We're in this galut, we're in this exile because of sinat chinam. Baseless hatred. You know what baseless hatred means? It means that that's not my brother. You know what God says? If that's not your brother, then I am not your father. We have to realize why we are in this exile. We are in this exile because of Sinat Chinam. We're in this exile because we have baseless hatred. We don't treat our fellow brothers and sisters like our brothers and sisters. So maybe something we could take upon ourselves is to start treating each and every Jew like our brother and our sister. Whether it's from our community or whether it's from a different community. Whether they originate from a certain town in the Middle East or whether they originate from a certain country in, you know, in Europe. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what our last names are. It doesn't matter how, what is the color of our skin. It doesn't matter anything other than the fact that each and every single one of us are brothers and sisters. And maybe if we start realizing the reason of why we have to mourn, the, realize, the reason that we are in this galut, maybe we don't have to mourn anymore. So, Bezad Hashem, may we take upon ourselves and we fix upon ourselves these things so that this Tisha B'Av could really be a day of Simcha, a day that we could have the rebuilding of the Bet HaMikdash.